Hello and welcome to our second episode of Disappeared the Abyss. Hello, Jacob. Hello, Alina. How are you doing? Doing well. Hope you're doing well as well tonight. <laughs> We're discussing an episode that's called A Mother's Secret. This case is about Paige Brofeld's disappearance. She disappeared on June 28th, 2007 in Grand Junction, Colorado. Just a few days before she disappeared on June 22nd, she met a friend at a pool party and brought up that she was worried or scared um, of her second ex-husband, Rob. Um, and she kind of brought up that she was afraid for her own life. And just a few days later, she attended a meeting, a mom's club meeting of moms of Grand Junctions. Um, and she seemed worried at that meeting to some of the other moms that attended the same meeting. Um, she worked several jobs since she had been recently divorced from her second um, ex-husband. So she worked as a um, dance class instructor for school kids. She worked with Pampered Chef, which the way I understand it, um, is a firm that provides you with uh, cooking materials, like what you need to cook with. And then you host a dinner party for your friends or potential customers and show them how well you can cook using um, these tools and then try to sell them to them. And according to her friends and family, she um, liked that job and made good money with it. She also sold slings for nursing mothers and she worked in adult business, which we'll get into later because there is a lot more to that. On June 28th, um, she called her friend Andrea and sounded more upbeat than when they met before. They didn't talk for very long, though. And Paige met up with her first ex-husband, Ron, who lived in Denver at the time, and both drove two hours to meet halfway. Ron and Paige split up because they had conflicting ideas about having kids and parenting, and she also worked as a stripper at, at a dance club at the time. Uh, it was called the Mile High Saloon. Paige told her friend Andre Andrea who she talked to that day, um, that she was still really loved Ron. When, after the meeting, they, they drove back and they kind of agreed that they would still talk when they got back home that night. And Ron called Paige when he uh, was back home and she hadn't quite made it back home yet. And so they agreed to talk again later that night. And then later he didn't hear back from her. So the next morning he... Um, tried to call her and her phone went straight to voicemail so he ended up um calling her home phone and he was already worried because usually she'd always uh, want to be able to reach um so so her kids could reach her so it's unusual for her to not be able uh, for someone not to be able to reach her her, her cell phone so he ended up calling her home phone, um, and her eight-year-old daughter answered the phone and told Ron that Paige didn't come home. So immediately after that, he decided to call Mesa County Sheriff's Office and report her missing. So that was just a few days after um, they met up. So they met up, like I mentioned before, on June 28th, just so we know this. And then the day he reports her missing is June 30th. Um, so her dad, when he hears about all of that, um, says that if she's missing, you're involved in a crime. She would never have left her kids. And a lot of this case, a lot with what we're talking about tonight is uh, her adult business does have to do with that. Um, Jacob, do you want to tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, so immediately, you know, law enforcement start to look into this adult business as uh, possibly connected to her disappearance. 
Uh, and they will find out about this through Ron, Paige's first husband. He's the one who tells police about it, though the family uh, appears unaware about her activities. Paige was using a separate name, Carrie, on a website called Naughty Nightlife, which you can kind of guess what that may have involved there. Her profile lists some of her services as escort services, erotic massage, uh, private dancing, and she also said on there that she was available for groups and parties. So Paige tried to make her advertisements on here look a little more classy um, than maybe other people on the website. Um, It's unclear still how far she went with this business, exactly what she was willing to give up for services, but her friends believe that she only worked in the adult business to support her three kids and uh, the house that they owned. And she was pretty organized with this business as well. She was known to have an extra cell phone uh, for conducting business on Naughty Nightlife. Now, we have to talk about Rob, who is the second husband of Paige. Paige met Rob when she worked at the Mile High Saloon in Denver, which is more or less a a strip club. Um, He comes from a very wealthy family. They were pioneers in the cell phone industry. He also set up a foundation that would give millions of dollars in equipment to fire departments in Colorado. Uh, I believe he was also a paramedic and was just involved in that industry. And he was known for kind of showing off how much money he had through his business ventures, but he would later lose almost all of this money after September 11th. And at that point, the family and the friends start to see a kind of a change in Rob. He starts to withdraw more and more from his family, um, not really speaking with friends of Paige. Uh, and eventually, Paige even calls 911. In 2004, uh, it was when she would call for the first time, and she claimed that he tried to or threatened to kill the kids. And this uh, led to a 911 call. Again, she would call in 2005, and she claimed that he slapped and shoved her while she was holding their youngest child. Um, Now, Rob's lawyer claims that much of this had to do with Paige's escort business. Uh, Rob apparently was not happy with the fact that she was engaged in this business, you know, being the mother of his children. This was not something that he wanted her to participate in. Now, Rob was arrested after the second incident in that related call, and he would plead guilty to harassment in a plea deal and did have to take some anger management classes. And two days after that incident, he would declare bankruptcy because he was unable to pay for the expensive equipment that he had donated to local fire stations. And suddenly uh, those fire stations were having to find a way to pay for that equipment. And ultimately it fell back onto taxpayers and Rob becomes a pretty unpopular guy. Now, Paige's family is looking at this situation. They're wanting to help her out. Uh, Paige's father sets up a bank account so that if she needs to, she can just get away from Rob if the situation gets so bad that she just needs to pack up and go. Paige's friends believe she was very scared of Rob, and they tell police about their concerns as well. On the Pampered Chef website, which Alina uh, alluded to earlier, they have a website and a forum on there. Paige wrote that even her children were afraid that Rob would come and kill her. Now, when she actually disappeared, though, Rob is in Pennsylvania, where he has eventually settled down. uh, And he went to Colorado right away when he heard that Paige had disappeared. Now, searches are done following her disappearance. They even bring in some bloodhounds, some canines to look around near the house. Uh, They do do that search, and it takes them beyond and then into the desert. One question that always pops up when someone disappears who's old enough to drive and we know that person has a car is, where's the car? That can always be a very important clue in finding that person and locating the 
missing person. Um, in the case of Paige, three days after her disappearance, her car is found. But it's not just found, it's found burning, which is a clear indicator that something criminal happened and shows that she has made it back into Grant Junction from her meeting with her ex-husband, Ron. Another search is underway on July 14th um, with the Abby and Jennifer Recovery Foundation. This search involves about 150 people. The next day on State Highway, some of her belongings were found. This involves check a checkbook, Blockbuster rental card, and other cards. Those uh, items found have her name on it and her kids' names on it. So it's uh, so investigators know these belongings uh, were theirs. Her items were found on the opposite side of town from where her home was and where she would have come in from Eagle, which is where she had met Ron on the 28th. Um, these objects may have been breadcrumbs that Paige threw out of the car. It could, they could have also have been dropped by someone else to divert them, divert police from finding um, her body. So it's kind of up in the air, like, which is it? Could she have really left breadcrumbs? Um, is someone trying to steer the investigation and lead them away from a potential body to be found? What, what do you think? My initial thought is it seems unlikely that she would be able to leave breadcrumbs. I, I don't can't think of many cases where someone has deliberately left behind items in order to help law enforcement find them. I think that requires a lot of foresight and uh, it's certainly a good idea, but I just don't hear of it happening that much. And how would she be in the situation if you're being taken and kidnapped that you have enough freedom and perhaps the windows open that you can start throwing things out of the car without being noticed or whoever is taking you to stop you from doing that. Um, I just think it seems unlikely. I think there's maybe a better chance that uh, whoever had those items was just disposing of them. Um, I've heard of that happening a lot more where people just throw things out of the car window that they don't want to have on them because it's evidence in a crime that they committed. What do you think? I totally understand where you're coming from with that. I've definitely, I do remember cases where we've heard that being the case. Um, and also when I, which is also, it's obviously very difficult to put myself in, in her shoes and in that um, situation. But if I hadn't read about that being a good strategy, if I hadn't I'd never heard um, that that might be a good idea um, to lead investigators uh, to where you're, you were, be, well, to lead investigators to where you're at, um, then I probably wouldn't think of that in a situation with like high adrenaline and it probably is hard to even think straight. But if if that was the case, if she left a trail of breadcrumbs, then that was really smart of her um, to do. That she probably could it could still be the case, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Though what you brought up that it's hard to imagine how that would happen. I, I agree. I have trouble seeing a situation where um, an abductor would just let her do that. Maybe a way that could have happened is, okay, it was summer, so it was hot. Maybe all the windows of the car were rolled down and she may have been um, in the back seat, like not conscious, unconscious, and just kind of came to it and had that idea and secretly threw some belongings out of the window. That's obviously a speculation. That's one way I could kind of see it happen. Another way could be that they're kind of struggling, that she's just doing that against his will and he's starting to like try to make her stop do that and the, the fight breaks out over it. Like I could see that too. Um, but then I, I just feel like if we knew if this happened over like miles and miles, then that seems unrealistic for her to do because I feel like whoever took her wouldn't let her do that for that long. But if uh, a lot of it is just found with it over, I don't know, 
not that much distance then I could see her just having like one chance or one or two chances to like maybe yeah get some belongings out and then they maybe spread from like the wind or something like that but it's really yeah, at this point we don't know for sure what happened. Well, regardless, it does give investigators some potential clues. They have some information to go off of now. But despite all of the concerns that the family and friends have raised about Rob Dixon, the ex-husband, he's officially cleared in this case. And police say they just don't have any evidence that he has been involved in any way. Cold case canine dogs search the area around Paige's car and they are able to find a link and lead lead investigators directly to the shop of a local mechanic that was next door to a parking lot where the car was found. His name is Lester Jones, and he may have actually been a client of Paige's adult business who she refused to meet with, and he may have not taken no for an answer. We know he was in jail before there was an incident in 1999 uh, where he chased his ex-wife up a mountain road that incident eventually ends with a jail sentence for Lester uh, for at least three years um, the father Paige's father at the time that the episode aired said that Lester didn't have much of a motive uh, for abducting or doing anything to Paige compared to the other people, perhaps Rob, that they had been uh, fearing for Paige's safety. Friends believed at the time of the episode as well that Rob was somehow involved, but his lawyer says that Rob cooperated and passed a polygraph test, and Rob and Lester allegedly had worked together for the same fire district, though, uh, and it's potentially possible that they had stayed in contact, but Rob's lawyer still denied that Rob knew or had talked to Lester Jones at any point in the past. And with that, this is kind of where we're left off um, when the episode ends. In tonight's case, however, we do have an update. Page, um, Paige's remains were found in 2012 by a hiker. Um, they were found in a gully in an area where volunteers had been searching. She was in a dry creek bed in a neighboring county. There were people that were in the area time after time over that five year period from 2007 to 2012. So her body must have been buried at least deep enough to have hidden it from people going by, Chief Deputy District Attorney Dan Rubinston explained. This was a quote. Her dental records um, proved that the human remains found were actually those of Paige. Investigators were unable to determine the cause of death. Her fractured cheekbone indicated, however, that she was beaten. Um, they also found duct tape that was close by her skull, which is an indicator that she was tied and gagged. The objects that were found along the road that we just discussed whether that could have been breadcrumbs or um, they could have been tossed out the window by an abductor to uh, steer the investigation another way. Um, those were leading towards the location of where the body was found. Investigators believe Paige threw them out of the window as breadcrumbs so people could find her. They were, however, still five miles away from where her body was found. And after they found her body, a cold case team was assigned to her case. We have another quote from her dad, Frank Bergfeld. Um, My feelings were so heavy dose of sadness. Even when we were searching, you wanted to find her, but you didn't want to find her, he said. So quickly, that cold case team and investigators will turn their sights back on Lester Jones. He's the main suspect in the case. There was only one other suspect who ended up being cleared because he was out of state. He was in New Jersey when Paige's car was set on fire, so they find it unlikely that he was involved anyway. But as we told you, Lester Jones has a previous criminal record, including a prison sentence for assault and att attempted kidnapping. 
The car was also found in the parking lot across from where Jones worked as a mechanic. The seat was pushed back as well uh, to accommodate someone who would have been much taller than Paige. And we know that Lester Jones was a tall and big man and certainly uh, would have made sense for him to push the seat back in the car. There is also a track phone and all four calls to Paige's work phone and the last call from her work phone to the track phone. So we have a connection there uh, between the cell phones of Lester Jones and Paige. But Jones denied owning such a phone, but we have video evidence of him buying the phone. So police are quickly able to figure out that that's not true. There's also evidence that they find when they do a search of Jones's workplace and home. Inside Jones's toolbox, they found handwritten phone numbers of other escorts, um, as well as their bra sizes, along with a condom, Viagra, and a pair of men's wigs. They also found a scale here. This is pretty key. A scale made by the pampered chef. That's Paige's um, business that she also conducts to make money. There were also pages leading up to the day that Paige disappeared that were torn out of a day planner in her car. So presumably Paige kind of kept a, a schedule of all her appointments and perhaps her adult escort business and the appointments that she had and the pages from that uh, leading up to her disappearance had been torn out by someone. And then there's a bizarre and kind of weird phone call between Lester Jones and uh, the local sheriff's department. The sheriff's office had seized two cars belonging to Jones so that they could be thoroughly searched. And they call uh, Lester Jones to let him know that uh, they have the cars ready to return. And when the sergeant is telling uh, Lester Jones this, uh, he says something about the sheriff's office asking where he would bury a body. And this confuses the sergeant who doesn't know what he's talking about, but he insists that um, the sheriff's office was asking him about where he should bury a body. So kind of just a weird exchange on the phone gives investigators a weird feeling about this guy as if they weren't already investigating him. So yeah, after this uh, very odd phone call, if we want to call it that, um, and Lester Jones was already their number one suspect in Paige's disappearance, which had now turned into a murder case um, soon after that in November 2014. This is over seven years after Paige disappeared. Lester Jones was arrested and charged with her murder and kidnapping. He didn't seem surprised. So when I read about this, uh, it just really mentioned, I guess this really stuck with the investigators, how he was not surprised when they arrested him, which kind of makes sense with what you've just told us about the phone call where he already seems to think they're uh yeah really zoning on in on him like really focusing on him and like thinking that he has something to do with Paige's disappearance and murder in July 2016 the trial against Lester Rolf Jones began the evidence in the case was circumstantial and this is kind of the reason why after six weeks of trial the jury was deadlocked Although they all believed that Jones was guilty, several had reasonable doubt, which can happen way more easily in a case where there's just circumstantial evidence. A mistrial was declared. In a second trial that ended just after Christmas 2016, the jury, however, reached a verdict, guilty of murder in the first degree. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. We have a quote from Paige's father, Frank Bergfeld. What happened to him doesn't bring Paige back. If he wanted to make a deal and skip prison and bring her back, I'd take it. And this just goes to show how even after all these years, her dad is still very sad and can obviously totally make sense, can't get over the loss of her, his daughter and what, yeah, it doesn't really even seem to care that much about what happens to Lester Jones. It doesn't bring him back his beloved daughter. And this will 
there will always be a part in his heart like missing um, that can't be filled because she won't come back. Um, we do know one thing too about her three kids. Um, they now live with their dad on the East Coast. We discussed previously uh, the breadcrumbs versus uh, was this the abductor? Well, we now know Lester Jones was he trying to steer the investigation in some other direction? Like who threw out these personal belongings out of the car? Um, now we know a little more about that. Has that changed our opinion on that? Uh, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I think you can definitely make a solid argument that perhaps she was leaving breadcrumbs now, knowing that her body would be found about five miles from where they found some of these items that appear to have been discarded on the side of the state highway. I still think, you know, we run into the same issues as before where the likelihood of her thinking and being able to leave a trail for investigators is pretty low. We also know that uh, Lester has not been the smartest with attempts to cover up any crime. Uh, he left a burning car right next to his business. He still had evidence of uh, calls with Paige and information about other escorts here. So I think you could also make the argument that he was just lazy and wanted to get rid of some of her personal belongings on his way to dispose of the body and just threw them out the window, you know, a few miles before he put her body into the ground. What do you think? I totally agree. I don't think I have much to add to that. Um, yeah, if he hadn't burned her car right next to his business, then maybe I think he's smarter because he did take those pages out of her planner um, to maybe hide that they had a scheduled meeting the night she disappeared. But considering that he was willing to burn her car right next to what would lead investigators towards him makes me think... It's just as possible that he would throw her belongings out fairly close to where he'd then bury her body. So I, yeah, both as possible. I, I don't think uh, I lean in one or the other direction. I think it's interesting, though, that investigators seem to believe that she left the crumbs. And yeah, I wonder why they seem so certain about that. But I guess we won't know. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. It's kind of interesting with the disappeared episode, watching Paige's father uh, talk about Rob and the family was so set on him as being involved in this case. And even we're saying, you know, don't worry about Lester. He doesn't have much of a reason uh, to want to harm Paige. And of course, in the end, we realize that he's the one who's going to be convicted of her murder. Is there was the family right to focus on Rob? Is there still a potential that he was involved in the case? I just I understand why they would focus on him for several reasons. For anybody who um, knows a lot of true crime cases, we know it's always the husband or the ex-husband or the boyfriend. Some some of those people are very often um, have to do with whoever disappeared or was murdered. Um, so that that gives them reason. Um, to think that another reason probably is that well, we know of the incidents where she called 911. I'm sure she's told her family and friends about um, those things. If she's been scared of him, if she's voiced to them that she's scared of her ex-husband in any ways, then yeah, if I, if I was them, I think, well, he, he, is, he just makes sense as the suspect. Um, but the more you get into the case and maybe when the disappeared for a uh, episode was filmed they didn't know as much about Lester Jones as we know now and um, maybe that's the reason they weren't as focused on him and just more focused on Rob in this case um, there's the suspicion that Rob and Lester knew each other and Rob possibly uh, hired him or had something to do with Lester uh, killing Paige I don't know how realistic that is. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think it's it's unlikely. Um, you know, as the Rob's lawyer even said in the beginning of the episode, investigators started looking into the men in Paige's life and as they should have done. You know, I think everyone's in agreement that that is a, a natural step 
in an investigation as you're trying to piece together what happened uh, to someone. But, you know, Rob, uh, as the police said, was ruled out as a suspect. Um, And while they certainly had issues in their marriage that ended in divorce, I think the police did a thorough investigation and uh, were not able to find any credible links to this case. I think uh, the motive may be a little unclear about why Lester would want to do this. There has been some reporting. Um, A fellow escort told investigators that Lester Jones um, had called Page for an appointment, but canceled when he realized that she was the ex-wife of a man with whom he worked at the local fire department. You hear the lawyer in the episode, though, say that uh, Rob did not know Lester Jones. They'd never spoken. So I don't think right now we know too much about the potential motives for this murder, but I think the likelihood of Rob being involved or having commissioned this in some way is, is pretty low. Another motive they discuss too or bring up as a possible motive is that he may may have wanted more than just a massage from her when she's naked or whatever else she'd be able to offer or be willing to offer. Like Maybe he wanted to have uh, sex, like full intercourse. But yeah, like you said, we don't know for sure what his motive was. That's kind of up in the air. And um, in regards to Rob and him having anything to do with Lester killing Paige yeah there ju- there just isn't anything to indicate that and I do feel like you know the police investigated the case just like you said they looked into his phone calls his phone records I'm sure they looked at the emails he wrote like there there would be something there should be some connection that they would have found between the two men and there just isn't and I think that to me is the main reason I mean he was clear too but those two things together I just don't see the connection there um yeah and just with what I wanted to bring up in this case is that it's always bittersweet when we have a case that's solved like this we at least it brings closure to the family and friends they now they were able to bury her and uh know where she's at and know what more or less know what happened and so they do get that bit of closure but it will never bring her back and it also eliminates any bit of hope that was left thank you for listening to the second episode of disappeared the abyss we'll see you next time